How's everyone doing? Hope you're doing well. I woke up with a massive headache, but it's starting to go away. And hopefully it will be gone away by the time I finish this coffee. The mystery box that I mentioned last week was this. The Behringer RD6 in lime green analog drum machine, which is a TR606 clone, but with some modern conveniences. It's got MIDI. It has USB, multi-outs. It's got this translucent case, which you gotta love if you are like a 90s kid or whatever. They come in like 10 colors. It's awesome. Uh, and they're super cheap. We're going to look at that a little bit today. It's fairly straightforward how to use it, what you can do with it. There's sort of a limited number of sounds in it. I've also made a small sample pack for YouTube channel members and uh, patrons. So uh, yeah, just go to your channel page and you should be able to find that. That includes 36 samples taken from this, accented, non-accented, with distortion or not. Uh, 36 sounds in total, and I think they're pretty useful. And then with those sounds today, we will be building some Citala uh, presets, drum kits, because Citala was also updated this week. One more thing that we will be looking at is a subreddit called Music Battle Stations. Basically showing your bedroom studio, professional studio, whatever, showing your music setup. And we're going to look at the best of all time, the highest rated. What else is new? Oh yeah, the other thing that I got that I mentioned a bunch of times last week, but it never arrived, is uh, this, the bulk of sample. This arrived. This is cool. Um, I like pretty much everything about it, except for two things. <laughs> Let's start with some gripes about the uh, Volca sample. Volca sample is a very small, portable sampler. It's got like 50 megabytes of, of memory or something like that. Maybe it's kilobytes. I don't know. It's tiny. It can have 200 sounds as long as they fit within that memory. So there's a couple things that are really annoying about it. The first is the power supply is a reverse polarity but it's also a different shape plug. So it's not going to work with, even though it's nine volt, it does not going to work with a pedal power supply. It doesn't include one. It's not USB powered. You need to find this like $30 uh, adapter that will probably have like $20 shipping. Or you can find an adapter that's like $4 that will work with your pedal power supply that you already own. And it'll have $40 shipping on it. The other annoying thing is that these 16 touch buttons here and the black lines on the bottom keep screwing me up where I think that that's like the division. Like you see here on the RD6, how they're sort of divided into these groups of four. Volca sample is not really, I mean, they are and they aren't. There's like a little gray line at the top, but when you're actually using it, it's really hard to tell like where each quarter step or like which, quarter note you're in. So I keep doing like 1, 8, 12 <laughs> as my quarter notes. I might have to like just draw a line there or something like that because I keep messing it up. Battery powered, has a little built-in speaker, sounds pretty bad. Honestly, it's pretty cool. It's hard to complain about it, but those two things are like very annoying. Chris, you still have your KCO SK1? I still got one. Mine is circa bent. I've added a, a patch bay, which... Um, you can connect various parts of the chip to other parts of it, which will glitch it out and stuff. John, do you have an actual Line 6 Helix or just the plugin? Just the plugin, yeah. But programming them is identical. There's a lot of limitations to the software version because of the hardware, which is kind of annoying. But the benefit is that anything you make on the plugin version will work on the hardware. So you can easily go between your studio and your live setup. Yeah, one of these days I'll bring up the KCO SK1. I gotta dig through a box for it. This is r slash music battle stations on Reddit. Really nice looking sort of basement or lower level studio, drop ceiling. Not a lot of acoustic treatment in here. So I see some foam on the wall, but that's about it. A, <laughs> two pieces of foam on the wall. Uh, maybe some more here by the desk, but it's a little hard to tell. Some nice looking... Uh, Maybe vintage speakers, maybe custom speakers hanging on the ceiling. There's a, an old 
old reel to reel, a I can't tell what that pioneer, pioneer reel to reel, some sort of a little sidecar console. What is that? A, a mini log, the original one. Another Korg synth there, but I'm not sure which one that is. Another small one. It's not the, um, it doesn't have a joystick, so it's not the Minilog XD, but very cool studio. The natural sunlight is, this is quite a, a vibe. I like the keyboard drawer. That's very, very cool. I want to have something like that someday. Yeah, very nice studio. Couch helps with a, as a bass trap, but not much acoustic treatment. It could definitely use a lot more acoustic treatment. It very well could be um, treated in the ceiling. Looks like a very comfortable place to play music. There's a nice looking one here. So it looks like they're running sonar, maybe? Looks like the dynamic range meter on the side. No, that, that's got to be Cubase. Uh, Cubase control surface, audience interface. A little um, Arturia, what is that called? Analog Lab, Rode mic, big uh, probably Native Instruments keyboard. Looks like a custom desk or, or something pretty fancy. It's got rack space. It's got these chamfered edges and a really cool view of the city. We don't see any acoustic treatment, but we don't really see much of anything. Can't tell what speakers these are. Nice place, though. This one relatable, guys. Hardly any desk space. Bad chair. No room at the computer for anything. Now, that's a battle station. But you got to start somewhere. He's got a couple different uh, interfaces and MIDI controllers. He's got a MPC, MPK Mini. He's got a Akai Fire, which is the uh, sequencer for FL Studio. And Elisa's... VI-49. It's, it's a pretty relatable setup, for sure. Truck driver's mobile battle station. Hopefully it doesn't do this while driving, but it looks like a an iPad or something. Bronco bass, maybe. <laughs> Actually, some really nice pedals. Caroline, Somersault, Strymon Night Sky, and an HX Stomp. Driving 13 hours while playing bass. I guess if you're stuck in traffic, that's cool, but... Please don't slap the bass and drive. I've seen these uh, these little carpet uh, desk mats or mouse pads a lot of times over the years. I, I don't really get the appeal, but they kind of look nice. They're a little bit they're a little more classy than the uh, ergonomic anime boob uh, <laughs> what do you call it mouse pads. Now, this is a really nice one. This is clearly some DIY stuff, but like really well done. Base traps uh, in the, the ceiling. Doesn't look like there's much on the walls unless this act, this wall is actually completely covered. Um, they, they do have a diffuser. Looks like a DIY wooden diffuser with some LED lights. Gaming PC setup there. Everything's white or black or black with white edges. So he's got like a custom sort of a pull-out drawer for his X-Touch. Not sure what this, this is, some sort of machine, Native Instruments machine, I would guess. Blue paint on everything. Really cool setup. Not my color scheme, but nicely done, yeah. Excellent execution of this. One thing I will say with a setup like this, you generally want to have your desk um, set up so that it's lengthwise. So like the speakers are fi firing down the long side of the room. Just making a guess here that this is the short side. So there, there could be a wall like right here. If this is actually the long dimension, then that's all good. But you'd probably want to have, have to block the window. A lot of people don't want, like to block the window and all that. And that makes sense. But for acoustics, that's the way you want to go. A 2002 battle station. It's pretty sweet, honestly. So, uh, two old iMacs. There's some, uh, I bet those are M Audio BX5 speakers or something like that. There's a, another G3 Mac. Maybe this is just monitors. Anyone 
recognize this dual CRT. I don't know. I also don't recognize this blue keyboard, but it looks sweet. He's got a Digi001 as his interface. Maybe a little Boss drum machine. Two turntables, of course. What are those monitors? I've never seen... These look like iMacs, but I've never seen, like, dual CRT setup. I can't even tell if it's two stands or, like, one stand for, for that. But yeah, <laughs> be a little afraid of those big, heavy monitors uh, breaking the glass of that desk. Cool place. No acoustic treatment at all. Back of a van mobile studio. Yeah, this is a situation where, again, you want... For acoustics, you want it going lengthwise, but also it's like super limited space. So it's probably not going to, to work out like that. But I could probably fit my studio in it, the back of a van. Uh, I'm not sure what model that is. A little fatty, maybe? There's tape on it for some reason. Subsequent 37? It's got to be that one. There's a... What do you call it? He's got a machine and an Ableton something. I always forget what those are called. A couple Digitact uh, or something like that. Good stuff. Clearly DIY desk, but totally functional. I guess he sits on the floor. This is on the floor, guys. <laughs> Big speakers. But yeah, like no room for mouse and keyboard. He sits on the floor. Feet tucked under the desk, I guess, or he sits cross-legged. I still like it. That's the retirement setup. I am thrice divorced, and I live in a van down by the river. Nice uh, China ball lighting here. That's pretty sweet. I've used these big, um, the big white ones. You can get those at, at Ikea. It's a nice soft light, and I've used those for my living room for years. Um, I used to have them in my last studio as well to light that room. Uh, but I never thought about having a bunch of little ones, different sizes and stuff. That, that looks really nice. Um, this ceiling is all kinds of weird shapes, which probably actually really good for acoustics. Um, this is like a partial wall, which is kind of weird, but maybe there's a staircase or something over there. Some sort of DIY equipment rack, storage. I know I've seen this one, the sequencer before, but I can't remember what it's called. Was that a, that a Novation synth there? Running Logic. Four MIDI keyboards. I'm not sure what that is. Elisa's sample something. Pretty cool setup. Three sets of speakers, I just realized. He's got some Aventones, some JBLs, and something else. With his weird sort of shaped ceiling, and get some nice indirect lighting. Fairly cool. This one's just called Cockpit 3.0. Nice high-res image. So we've got multiple sets of speakers at different angles. So he's got some KRK Rocket 8s probably. Maybe not Rocket Series, maybe the level above that. Or this DJ setup. Separate, maybe a Samsung laptop there. His main setup, he's got a, a rack of Moog little synths. He's got a, some sort of hardware sequencer. I don't recognize this one. He's got a Rolly. I just keep saying he, but it could be anything. I don't know. I'm just assuming. Some sort of hardware mixer, looks like. When these are in the dark and kind of blurred from a cell phone pick, it's a little hard to tell what some of these things are. That's a machine. This is... It's not a Behringer mixer, is it? Is it an X32? I don't see any guitars. I do see there's some acoustic treatment. Mostly foam. There's some effort there. Nice looking speakers. These are Persona speakers, I think. Four monitor setup. Seems like one PC, four monitors. Very cool setup. So he's going to be mostly facing this corner. Probably not the most, you know, the best option for acoustics to, to be facing the corner. It makes sense because he's got this DJ setup here. But if this DJ setup was over on this wall and this was facing there, you kind of have some empty spots in the corner. He still kind of does anyways, but that would be just a little bit better for acoustics. Nice place. This is my girl cave where I do girl shit. It reeks of farts in here. <laughs> okay, cool. 
There's some Powerpuff Girls stuff. There's some coloring books, some toys, nice colored overlays on these, um, I think they're Electron um, samplers. There's a Electribe. There's some Volcas. There's some guitar pedals. There's an OP-1. There's a Akai MP MPK, a Pioneer DJ setup, FL Studio. Yeah, cool stuff. No acoustic treatment, bad place for the monitors. It's a mess. <laughs> it looks like they do some cool shit in here. You buy an OP-1, there's no money left for the studio? Yeah. I can't tell the age of this person because this room is like as messy as my daughter's, but then there's like music gear in here. So they could be 18, <laughs> they could be 35, they could be 14. I don't know, but it's cool. Here's a more more traditional you know, exactly the way you should set it up, sort of home studio. Nice equipment rack. There's a patch bay, graphic EQ, something, don't know. Something else I don't know. QCon, the uh, Icon QCon series, um, control surface. They must work in like audio post or something to, uh, to need that many track channels. Focusrite interface looks like an old uh, Sapphire JBL monitors. I think these are pretty cool setup. It looks like they've got some acoustic treatment. These are either DIY or purchased uh, bass traps, broadband bass traps. And then there's some foam here. Drop ceiling is going to help with acoustics as well. Um, I would probably get rid of this foam and, and do something better there. I see that they've got this curtain here to hide some cable clutter or something. There's a pro tip, get a curtain, put it over the back of your, your desk and you won't see these cables hanging down. I should do that, but also uh, I need the airflow, my hot legs. Anyways, pretty cool place. A little baby size Euro rack, right? Is Andy still here? This is a, uh, what, half the size of, of Synchrotron's Euro rack setup? I was looking into uh, buying some cables and uh, very expensive. It starts getting very expensive. I guess if I need like a hundred cables or something like that for a Euro rack setup, my best bet is to just put in like a dealer order from uh, Alibaba. It's like 50 cents a cable or less, but you need to probably buy like a thousand of them. Euro rack setup, pretty cool. I can't identify probably 99% of these. This has a an antenna on it. Korg MS-20, looks like. And under that, there's possibly a Moog, possibly a Behringer synth. I don't know. Cool setup, though. Ha, huh, he thinks it's finished. This is a home studio. Lighting could be better. Not being up against the wall might be nice. Uh, but this is a very, yeah, very nice. Ah, uh, some resolution. This is a big monitor, really big monitor, but it looks like it's only about 720p, so there's not a lot of information that you can display at once. I mean, you could, it looks like you could sit in the bathroom and still see the, the mixer. <laughs> what is this? Attack, matchless, really tell how many channels that is, but yeah, nice console. Uh, not a fan of this carpeting, but. I mean, if we're, if we're being nitpicky about this stuff. Yeah, cool. There's a Reaper user here. Some full cow monitors and some Yamaha mo monitors. I really like this style of home studio. Nice tall ceilings. Some exposed brick for vibe. Uh, Mid-century modern furniture. Maybe a Profit there. Hofner base. Uh, Jaguar. There's a, a Rhodes. That's some sort of small Moog, maybe a Sub-37 or, or a little fatty, MS-20, iPad as a control surface. Uh, can't see what's going on for monitors, but that's a pretty weird looking monitor. Another one of those weird chairs as well. No room on the desk for equipment, so it's it sits in a chair. But that's all cool. It's still a really cool space. Uh, looks like music actually gets made here. I enjoy it. I, really, I like that one a lot. Looks like a great place just to 
write music, and it will very likely come out sounding indie. <laughs> but yeah, it's a great vibe. I love it. <laughs> There's lots to zoom in and look at in this one. Interesting view of this this abandoned building. So sort of must be in, in kind of an industrial area on the water, which is nice. Egg speakers. Those are made by SE. Some sort of keyboard drawer with a little mini keyboard there and maybe another one here. Power amp, power conditioning. I haven't noticed power conditioning in the other um, sets, but this is a really cool tool or maybe it's pedal storage. Not labeled with what's in it, but looks like mid-century modern kind of a style of also DIY equipment racks. Love that. Love seeing the the plywood. Oh, there's a cat here. Patch bay. Stuff with cables. Who knows what's actually in those racks, but lots of stuff. Um, acoustically, of course, I mentioned this before, you would want your desk, your speakers on this wall by the window. The layout of, of this space is most efficient this way. For mixing, you want it the other way. A um, dope for analog modular system times four. There's some guitar amps. There's some little keyboards and sequencers. There's a 808. There's a Volca. Don't recognize this. Very cool stuff. They've got acoustic treatment and it seems to be pretty much in the right spots. So if this is their mixing area, they've got it above the speakers, behind the speakers, and on the wall directly behind. And then it looks like they've got another computer set up over here. But um, not the most comfortable place to, to sit. There's no leg room or anything like that. So probably when they're working over here, they're standing. I like it. I like it a lot. Looks expensive. Why buy the window because of reflections? No, you just want to be like lengthwise. You want the longest length to be the um, the direction that the speakers are going. Because if he's here, unless it's equal distance to this wall and to the other side of the rim that we can't see, then one speaker is going to be reflecting back to your ears before the other. Because, yeah, there's no acoustic treatment on this wall here. So you want the, the speakers to be lengthwise so that your side walls are equal distance from the speakers and then it's easier to treat one wall for reflections missing out on the view the natural light the airflow all that stuff i would say that's probably more important in a lot of cases so awesome place temporary battle station for the week almost looks like a hotel lobby sort of thing out on the water by the lake i don't really recognize anything there's a grand piano there's a bunch of pillows around it yeah, not much to say about this one, really. Um, It looks like acoustic treatment on this wall. It'd help a bit, because it's all windows, so lots of reflections. But with this shape of room, it might actually sound really nice. Because it's non-parallel surfaces. Real World Studios. This is Peter Gabriel's studio in England. That's what it looks like on the outside. They should probably clean this moat. I've never seen a picture of it actually cleaned up. Inside, very, very cool. Huge SSL console wraps around in a U shape. Um, big equipment racks, tons of guitars, amazing speakers, everything you could want, really. How would you deal with a room that has one wall that's on an angle? You could try to make it like your front wall or your back wall. It's tricky because um, you, you don't. You don't want parallel walls, but also that is like the most predictable environment. Yeah, otherwise you're going to want to add a lot of acoustic treatment to that wall to make it, to make that less reflective. Uh, this is the picture that I actually wanted, or that made me want to cover this topic on the, the thing. How long have we been going for? What's our uptime today? This is clearly like an attic. There is consideration to acoustic treatment. I don't think it's probably the best kind of acoustic treatment for this space. This 
is probably a custom desk setup. Although saying that, it does kind of also look like IKEA parts, which is fine. Um, like it's a, a really good use of the setup or of the space available. Everything fits. These panels aren't going to do enough to treat this space. The layout is correct. So here's the opposite angle. A space like this is very tricky because there's not a lot of headroom. You've, like, you've got these low ceilings. Sound reflects back down towards the center. It's sloped, but it also seems pretty low. Um, very tricky setup. Um, so this desk setup seems very good. It's covering the radiators. Not ideal. Um, I mean, you might not even need that most of the time. If those are off, that's great. So what you would want to do is treat this entire wall, this entire like triangular triangular area here. This should be 100% absorption. Um, this one little panel is doing nothing, practically. Like these panels here, they probably are well-made panels, but they look like they reflect. And so in a situation like this where you're getting a lot of reflections back off of this wall, uh, off the ceiling, um, this is not a this is not a big distance from your ears, so you want to go like a hundred percent absorption if possible. Yeah, it sucks to lose the headroom here, but that would be a good place to put some base trapping, at least the thickness of this beam. Um, try to get some of that filled in. This this whole wall, hundred percent filled in, and uh, these these panels have some sort of it's supposed to be like diffusion. Um, these these slots here, but it, it looks like it's a hard material. You would want to get rid of that and have it completely soft from the desk to the ceiling kind of coverage. That would help a lot. And then there's this really long distance. This is probably 20 feet where we're probably going to get some reflection back off this back wall. Any sounds would be bouncing off these windows and all across this room. We've got parallel walls on this length. And then this this wall here is parallel with this wall here, at least below the desk. Might not make a big difference, but you might notice something kind of in the middle. There's probably a dead spot like right here. Does this all make sense? Hopefully. Cool space, not ideal acoustically. I think he's done a good job with the equipment layout. Um, I would probably make these racks at an angle, at like a... 30 degree angle to the desk, maybe 60 degree or so, so that you can see it without having to be directly in front of it. These uh, three or four racks here, can't really see what's happening. He's got two sets of, of speakers that are basically the same, just slightly different sizes. I don't think there's any point in doing that. Just pick one. Yeah, 100% covering this wall because your speakers are not going to sound very good like this. They're rear ported, I bet, so not ideal. Not the best situation, but good job. I always thought this one was like fake, but I don't know. There we go. There's music battle stations. So Satala 2 just came out. This update is actually a paid update. Satala 1 is free. Satala 2 is paid. They're asking $20 for it right now. This gives you standalone version, Apple Silicon support, a new layout with the 4x4 NPC style layout. It helps you find the missing samples. It follows dark mode and it comes with a couple new factory kits. So there's 16 pads, drag and drop sound management, easily rearrange kits. There's beat slicing, shape, compression, tuning, tone, volume, pan, controls on it. There's editable MIDI map, built in file browser, preview all sounds in a folder, automatic MIDI out for Reaper, VST, audio unit, AEX, and standalone modes. So you do need to buy a license for this version. Uh, the old version is linked here. Um, you can also go to the FAQ page. Version 1 is still here. Here is Satala 2. To be honest, I wish it was re resizable. It's not yet, but this is the dark mode. So if I switch my Mac over to light mode, you see that the interface automatically follows that, as does Reaper. But I do like the dark mode. I do prefer it. So...
upon upgrading to Satala 2, your existing projects should still work. Um, the factory kits, the user kits that I've made, uh, these things all work. And if you prefer the layout of the old style, you can click here to layout and then 16 by one pads. And there you go. So that's the 707 kit uh, that I made on stream a while ago. Here's the clean 808. Apple Silicon support has been um, long awaited. I bought the update today. It's not a sponsored video. This is, I, I actually paid for it because I've been using their software for quite a while. I've probably made more than $20 from using it. We're gonna start this off by adding a new plugin so right-click, insert virtual instrument on new track. I'm going to select Satala from the list, which is right here. Upon double-clicking or hitting enter on this, it will ask if you want to build the routing for this. If you say no, you get the stereo version. If you say yes, you get a 32 out version. Uh, then we can close the effects browser. Each uh, channel is automatically routed out to these separate tracks, and they're even labeled, which is super nice. So. So each of the 16 pads goes to a separate track with Satala uh, itself being on its own channel. Uh, we can take all of these, put them into a folder, and call this drums. Each pad has its own set of controls. So there's shape, which is kind of like an ADSR, but it's kind of more, it's more user-friendly essentially. So you can, so negative numbers adjust the tail and positive numbers adjust the attack. And you can see what's happening in the waveform and in the overlay, the yellow overlay. So yeah, you can shorten that sound, make it softer at the attack, which adds a lot of variety to the sounds. There's tuning control, and it shows you kind of the fundamental pitch, something I really love about Satala. Um, I find I do try to like exactly match a certain number when I'm doing this, because there's these lines here. But yeah, it could just help you with the tuning. So if something sounds a little off, it's at some sort of weird number. It doesn't show you like the exact number, but kind of pretty close. But yeah, I like that a lot. Panning, compression. So you can kind of, as you turn up the compression, it's showing you exactly what part of the waveform will be turned down. but the attack is always sort of going to be retained. The transient's always kind of going to still be there. So it, the drums are always punchy here. For tone, this is a really dynamic sort of EQ. As you turn this, it's not like a specific frequency. It's not a just a low cut, just a high cut. It's like... A lot more dynamic so turning the tone down a little bit is going to give you this this mid scoop but then going further it's flatter again and it starts taking off some of the high end the opposite is also true there's a little mid bump starting at like 400 hertz or so and as you increase it's starting to pull away more of the lows going further up it starts sweeping that mid band boost all the way up to about 20k and then further on, it starts cutting more of the lows until it's just a, a low cut at like 500 hertz. I've got all these keyboards and none of them turned on fail. So let's start with it all the way down at minus 100. Real subby. And uh, here's the, the mid scoop. And then here's the mid boost. And then here's sort of like at 5K real punchy, and then all the way up, just the highs. So with these, these uh, four controls, shape, tuning, compression, tone, you get a ton of variety in, in shaping the tones really quickly. There's also things like trigger modes, one shot or gated, so the, the note can sustain. You can use like a bass sound or uh, sort of like a single waveform kind of thing and just sustain it and you press the button once to start playing it and then press it again to 
turn it off, kind of a, a looping mode. For trigger modes, you can have a second. Um, so let's say every time you hit your snare, you want your hand clap to trigger at the same time. So you go to trigger and then set this to snare and I'm gonna hit the snare. Now, when you hit the hand clap, that will also trigger the snare. I always get that backwards. I also want this to trigger the clap. And I also want to trigger the clave. That can all be done with from this menu. And then choke is usually used for symbols. So let's say I've got the closed hi-hat and the open hi-hat. Closed hi-hat, I want to choke the uh, open hi-hat. It's already set up like that, but as soon as you hit the close hi-hat, this open hi-hat will uh, be muted. So the you might also want to choke itself. So like the kick is already set up this way. Let's set it to none. It's going to kind of keep triggering over itself. And otherwise, it's just a tighter sound. That's the quick overview of how to use Satala. Let's also build a kit. I've got a free sample pack for patrons and YouTube members of the Behringer RD6. It's a great drum machine. Going back to my sample set, each drum, including the combination of closed and open hi-hat simultaneously, so A is a normal hit, B is a accented hit, C is a normal hit with distortion set to the minimum value, and D is distortion with accented hits. So uh, again, looking at this, there's this accent knob, and there's also the accent switch. So when I'm in play, you can make hard hits. You can control how hard that is how much of a level boost you get on the accent. So if I do these last four, and if I turn all the way down, there's no accent. So the accent was at like 75%, and um, the distortion mode was actually at the minimum value, um, which does a low cut for the kick, snare, and toms, but it also smooths the high end of the cymbals. So I really like that the cymbals sound nicer. One of the great things about sampling it is you can mix and match and you can have all the low end of the normal and accented kick drum, but you can have the softer cymbals um, with the distortion on. Try, I'll show you what this is like when you turn up the distortion amount. And I don't really like it, especially of how it makes things start to sound harsh. With the distortion off, it's such a classic sound. If you don't already have a TR-606 sample library that you love, check it out. You just need to be a, a channel member. Back to Satala. We're going to take those samples. Let's build a kit with... Um, let's do the normal hit. So I'm just going to drag these in. Once we get them in, we can, um, we can rearrange them. There's only like 10 drums here, so we're going to... Uh, be able to rearrange these pretty easily. We could put these in order of what they are on the drum machine. That would be one way to do it. Or we could uh, plan to do it for like finger drumming, which is a little bit different. Um, if you're doing finger drumming, you might want to have kick on the middle and even have two of the same, and then you have hi-hats and then you have snares on the sides. But if you're just programming it, you probably want to do something like this, where you've got your hi-hats, and then maybe... And let's put the clap there. Toms. Something like that. Yeah, so let's try programming something in. So um, one of the great things about using Satala is it automatically gets the names of those notes in your um, MIDI editor. So we can just hit this drum mode button, and then there's all the, uh, all the samples.
you snare on two and four. Yeah, something like that. Do a cymbal at the top. Bring the clap in to follow the snare on the second time. Is the audio going through the feed? It sounds like it's just the mic. Good question. Um, the drum machine was not. I should have looked at the chat earlier. I'm hearing it through the speakers, but you guys aren't. So now that we have this, this thing set up, we can start tweaking it or retuning it. So let's say we want our hi-hats to be higher pitched. Okay, so this one we want to choke uh, CHOH, and we also want to choke the open hat. And this one we want to choke opposites. Um, and then this one should probably choke the open hat and the uh, semi open. The hardware doesn't have pitch controls. It doesn't have like individual volume controls necessarily. They're, they're, the toms are on one knob, the clap and the cymbal are on one knob. There's a switch to choose uh, what you're seeing for when you're programming it. And the all the hi-hats are through this volume knob. It does have individual outs for these. The two hats, the clap has its own out, the cymbal has its own out, the two toms are there. And running out of these skips or bypasses the distortion. You can actually make a pretty complicated setup with that. But yeah, going back to the plugin, yeah, we've got things like tuning and tone shaping and stuff. I can easily switch these over to the B mode. Now these will be all accented. Can I, sh I can't shift click, I can't select multiples, unfortunately, but so let's do, let's kind of do the ultimate sort of thing. We'll do all accented kick and snare, and then the hi-hats will be um, distortion, but unaccented. The toms will be accented with a uh, distortion. Basically what I'll do here is, is reset this and then save this as a new kit. And then I will include this kit um, for anyone that has Satala 2 um, and has the, the the drum kit. Save kit as. I'll put this into Dropbox. RD6 Satala. Yeah, exactly. TR6 to 6. Um, they've got a, a 303 clone as well. I've heard that the programming is um, is hell <laughs> in that. My only complaint with this one, and it's Probably a complaint on the original hardware as well is that you can't see the pattern like if you're just like paused because these buttons go to the different patterns and when you're in play that's when you see what each each drum thing is doing and then the track right in play modes I I'm completely lost I've seen a couple of videos about that and I'm I'm just completely lost on it but you can do some cool stuff with the trigger outs trigger out the sync in and out the or the individual outs on the back you can do some cool stuff i was triggering my mavis using rd6 as the the clock
it's it's harder than it looks to to match Reaper's MIDI grid to this grid. Oh well. Okay, I don't know what we're doing anymore. So Tala and Sower is awesome. I cannot figure out Sower. Um, I tried it recently. It doesn't work on M1 Max without a uh, without Rosetta, so I'm very unlikely to use it. How do you save the note names as a template for drum VSTs? Good question. Okay, so so Tala actually outputs the drum the note map automatically somehow actually don't know how it does it um but yeah it it does it and if we switch this i don't know at what point it it refreshes yeah when we're when we reload the the thing it refreshes well actually let's start from the beginning so let's say we're like this we want to rename something we can double right click and we can individually uh, individually name something. Double right click. It's very weird. That's how you do it. Once you have something in here, right click up in this area or or from the file menu, file, note names, and then you can save that to a file. I've got a few of them saved here already. And then file, note names, load, uh, right there. And there's some uh, there's some recently used ones here. But otherwise. It just goes to the right folder, MIDI note names folder in Reaper's config uh, folder. I've got one just for like chromatic notes. So it's just every note name in there. Uh, clear note names. Yeah, it came back. Okay. Um, if you want to do that for a template, you need to put in like a track template. You have to put in the MIDI note, uh, a pattern, add the template. And then I think you also need to have this option, one MIDI editor per track. I think this needs to be enabled for that to work. Once you have the note name map in there, you can use the action, show hide note rows, unused and unnamed. And then for drums, you want to be on triangles or diamonds. But I've got a shortcut on my toolbar. Go from piano mode or default settings over to drum mode, where it sets it to diamonds, hides unnamed and un unused note rows. That's it. Those are the two modes I mostly use. I ruined my sleep and my posture and my, my fingers and wrists this week by playing Diablo 4. <laughs> so... That's what I would like to be doing right now, to be honest with you. Isn't there an M2 Mac Mini? Yeah, my mic is on. We got audio, we got music. The the Mac Mini right now is an M2 chip. $7.99, free shipping. Chris, it's the time to buy a uh, Mac Mini. Diablo would be better with the Doom soundtrack. I don't know about that. Diablo soundtrack's pretty great. I wish I had a b more ergonomic gaming setup, but I do not, and it hurts <laughs> to, to game. Look what I found. You guys hear about this? Moog is no longer an employee-owned company through a partnership with InMusic. Is this doom and gloom? Is this... A good thing? I don't know. What does In Music own? Is that the company that Arturia? No, not Arturia. Um, Alesis, Akai. Yeah, an Air, right? They bought up all the letter A's. They, yeah, they own a lot of companies. I don't really know what to think of 
that. 4M audio has been traded so many times. And then um, the other industry news this week was uh, Native Instruments. It was in my inbox, but I don't actually know where the, I don't remember where the link is. But yeah, Native Instruments is now like the parent company name. They're in a partnership with Plugin Alliance and Isotope as the Soundwide brand. And now it's just going to be Native Instruments coming eventually all three of the plugin installers are going to be just in native access i don't know what to think about that i think generally that's kind of bad i kind of like plugin alliance i feel like that is the name that uh should be used but i guess plugin alliance doesn't like they've got brainworks plugin alliance software is all third-party stuff so Plugin Alliance can't just rebrand as Native Instruments, but they did do this. Plugin Alliance by Native Instruments. All these companies like merging and stuff, is that good for the users? I don't know. So these are all the Plugin Alliance brands. These aren't all brands that are owned by Plugin Alliance. Like Brainworks is like the main company. These are our other things that are sold within this store or distributed through this store. Plugin Alliance is part of Native Instruments together with Isotope and Brainworks. So these, this used to say Soundwide. Maybe this really has no, no difference for users. They might do another free bundle, but they called it, they called it Soundwide back in 2022 and now it's just Native Instruments. One unified login for all your accounts across our brands. You don't have to remember multiple sets of login details. Use a password manager. That's something that's not difficult. <laughs> I'm currently using 1Password. I used to use LastPass. They're both good. Utilize native access as a preferred destination for installing and authenticating a broader range of products, reducing the need for multiple product installation tools. Okay, this last part, reducing the need for multiple product installation tools, great that consolidates things in general i like the plugin manager approach to things especially when you get a new computer when you've got 400 plugins to install you don't want to have to do 400 separate plugin installations the managers definitely help with that they all have problems let's get into the rant portion of this plugin alliance this one doesn't tell you what you have installed. When you click on native M1 products, it doesn't sort by the ones that you own or have installed or the ones that were recently updated. That's the biggest problem I have with this one. Once you pick your plugins, it goes through the installation stuff automatically for you. So you can select all 167 native VSD3 for M1 products, whether you own them or not, and install that. So all they need is my products and then um, recently updated or M1 only. But, but yeah, I can select my 19 Plugin Alliance plugins, download and install, set and forget, essentially. I like that. But it doesn't show you what you have installed already and what's been recently updated. Spitfire thing, it's a train wreck. Don't even go there. Isotope. Oh, yeah. Plugin Alliance thing when I... It crashes on quit. I still product por portal. I don't like the look of it. Something I really hate about it is um, there's no current updates, but I recently updated Ozone 9 Advanced. And when you click on it, it goes to the Ozone 10 website, not like Ozone 9 frequently asked questions or change log or anything like that. There's no way, like, I can't just click on this and see what changed in version 9.13. What changed? When it was on the update page, clicking on it just started the upload, or the, the download and install process. Downloading Ozone 9 and RX9 standard to, to update them. Who knows what even changed? It took over half an hour to do those two plugin bundles. So I'm opening up RX9 um, for the first time after the update. What changed? About...
No? Can I get a change log, please? Nope, just nothing. No what's new. That's annoying. The other thing is, and this is probably the worst thing, they disabled the quit shortcut. So it goes to the uh, notification area instead of, uh, you know, the normal quitting. Super annoying. And then the other installer was Native Access. They changed their logo. And I have to say that Native Access has gotten better over the years. It's better than Support Center. Like I can select this, I can see release notes. Cool. That's expected. Like that, that's how it should be. Click install. It's all kind of automatic um, for the stuff that you have. You can go to installation path. Oh, it's not installed yet. Installation paths. It can show you exactly where that thing is. You can go to that folder. So native access, I guess, is the better of them. But when this first got updated, what, January or something like that, it was crashing a lot. It seems better this week than it has been. <laughs> go to shop. There's a shortcut for a shop. Yeah, I have a feeling that the next update to native access is just going to have like all of the isotope stuff, all of the native access or native instrument stuff and all the plug and alliance stuff kind of merge together and it's going to be a shop and license manager. Since I already have those three accounts, am I still going to have to put in three passwords? if it logs me out after an update or something like that. I guess it's a step in the right direction, but there's a lot of friction in the meantime. Your native access looks nothing like that. I'm surprised it didn't force you to update because almost every time I install it, it will, won't let me do anything until I update it. Wave Central, uh, yeah. I don't have any Waves plugins to, to complain about. The Wise Launcher is also bad. I hate all of them, honestly. What's, what's a good one? UVI Portal? All right, IK Multimedia's pr product portal. It always logs me out. It always logs me out. There's always something weird here. Oh, maybe they actually fixed it. I think they actually fixed it, yeah. These, these things down here, where it says updates, it, this wasn't a, a link at one point. So there's this list and you'd click on it and then nothing would happen. But yeah, now there's, now there's sorting. This is all a good. So there's two updates to do. Tonex seems to have an update every day or so. I don't hate this updater because it has release notes. I would like to see like more changes, like the whole history of changes. Why not? Manuals, presets. I still haven't even used Tonex. I, I keep updating it. I just never use it. But yeah, in general, like I like this stuff. The the new like the things to trial and buy aren't that intrusive i've got everything easy to find here even stuff from like 2007 is here and and uh all manageable automatically authorizes after install so i like that i don't think it needs notifications but at least this isn't like running in the notification area constantly or anything like that it I don't think it installs anything in the background. Native Instruments stuff will install helper things, and there's always pop-ups every time it updates. NKS stuff running in the background, even if you don't have the hardware. I've got complaints about all of them, but I feel like IK's is pretty good overall, uh, as long as it keeps you logged in. And Native Access has gotten better than it was only a year ago. Oh, Arturia. Uh, there's the soft tube one as well. Arturia Software Center. Let's let's check it out. IK is annoying in Reaper all effects show, but only want to see what I have. Yeah, there is that. I get why they do that. Because most of this stuff is the custom shop, so you can instantly unlock it. Arturia Software Center just won and saw some things and fails to tell you why. Yeah, I was getting that a lot but it has been okay recently. Okay, updates, but what changed? Release notes, integration of Keylab Essential, bug fixes. I never reported that issue, I just realized. 
Is there a workaround for IK listing everything? Yeah, I can show you that. There isn't a, a setting in IK's thing, but if you go to your um, plugin manager, book effects browser, and you go to like, um, if you got an IK multimedia folder, what's one I don't have? CSR plate. Right click, rename effects, put a, a pound sign hashtag in there. And that will hide it. If you go to your options for effects, show an effects list, plugins that begin with pound sign, uncheck that or make sure it's unchecked. And then you can hide certain things. So I don't have any of the CS CSR things. You just rename, add that to the start and we'll take it out of the list. Uh, the other thing you could do is when you're in here, edit folder. So I could do not x86. I could do not CSR. And that will also take that out of the list. Although CSR stuff might still be available when you search. The filters for the smart folders don't help in all situations, but sometimes. I have probably like 80% of them. I actually don't even remember how to get to the, uh, what's the rack one? What What's the full T-Rax thing? I forget what that's co even called. Of course, IK also has the custom shop installer manager that you need for Amplitude, T-Rax, and Sample Tank. So um, when I go here, you can see how many credits I have. I can see which things I have purchased, I think. I think I can easily show what I have. I have 251 owned gear. I can see everything I have unlocked here. And I'm not sure what I don't. I have 197 items in Amplitude and I have 27 in T-Rex, three in Sample Tank. I guess what I would want to see is what I don't own. I don't know if that's an easy thing to do. But the reason that that T-Rex stuff all installs together is so that you can instantly try something. So if you're interested in this Fame Studio Reverb, you could add it to cart, um, or you could just hit the try button and it unlocks that plugin for three days or something. Okay, so... I don't know what else we're doing. I've got 11 updates in in here. Real-time text-to-speech feedback, accessibility features, plugin interface can now be dynamically resized by dragging corner. That's always a nice thing. Let's see if that will update without crashing. That that's the kind of the only complaint about this over the years is that like when you're doing an update it will just fail and won't tell you why. Bundle installer that actually works pretty fine is UVI in Arturia. I should, I don't have much for UVI. I think it worked okay last time. It needs to be updated. This, this happens with all of them. They constantly have to be updated and they don't work if they, they're not updated. I think PlayStation's probably the worst for that. You can't use YouTube unless the system is up to date. Yeah, I forget what the, the T-Rex used to just be called T-Rex. And now I don't see that that anywhere. Sweet. T-Rex Sweet. This is something I haven't used in five years, probably. How do we do parallel chains? I thought you could do that. I thought there was a way to do like parallel chains. They take that away. UVA is part of FL Studio now. Yeah, there's another merger thing. Hope you get paid for the ads that interrupt your live stream. It's four of them since the stream started. Some of you can't skip. Yeah, I do have ads on. There was one time I clicked the button on purpose when I went for a break. I probably don't get paid very much. These, these streams cost me a lot of money to run because I hire an editor. I don't get much out of the 
the streams in terms of money. Uh, I usually lose subscribers when I do streams and the stream recaps, and uh, I don't get super chats and I don't get new members. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm here because it's it's fun and there's you know there's a small number of people that have been to every stream and uh, and um, participate and have a good time. Yeah, support on Patreon. Patreon's a big thing to have. Uh, YouTube ads. Support has gone down by a lot over the past year or so. It's gone down by about $500 a month. So from the peak that it was at, it's actually gone down by $500, which is rough. So Patreon helps one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons, courses, all these sorts of things. I was hoping to get more memberships this year, doing more like member exclusives things, uh, streaming more, all this sort of stuff. It was just hoping that we would get more reliable uh, payment. It almost seems like a bug in YouTube that made it go downhill. I don't know. The Reaper blog is not just a YouTube channel. And sometimes I forget that. And maybe some people don't realize that. It's a way to get people to the website where I've got the one-on-one -on -one lessons, where I've got the courses, where I can do uh, sponsored uh, promotions and things like that. Uh, there's also the Patreon, which has just been reliable source of income for me as well, but not a, a huge amount. It's probably lower than it should be for a channel of my size. But yeah, I appreciate you guys being here, watching the videos, helping any way you can. One-on-one -on -one lessons are $50 an hour. Oh, Alejandro had a video or a, a question. He had a chain that was like a, a amp and cab, then a gate afterwards. So let's say regate. And he wants the sound of the DI to trigger the gate on the aux input. So this is, uh, aux input is 3-4, right? So how do we get that to work? One thing I like to do is just add in some plugin that does nothing, like re-EQ in this case, will work fine. We're gonna set the track to four channels. And then we're gonna copy, um, we can just set this to do nothing on one and two and send out to three, four. So in one, two goes to three, four. I think that's right. That should be copying that over to channels three and four. And then the gate should be getting the DI signal. I'm pretty sure I have that right. I think there's also another plugin for that. You want to bypass this plugin in the middle. This is only working on channels one and two. It's doing nothing on channels three and four, but regate is operating on channels one and two, but listening to channels three and four for the gate signal. And by setting the, the plugin pins like this, Pretty sure this is right. I see a lot of people saying like, you've got to do shorts, but shorts do not work for me. I don't enjoy making them. The ones that I've made don't really get views. And to make money from shorts, you need to have millions of views, a dollar per million views or some something stupid like that before you get any ads from that. It's supposed to be good for subscribers, but unless I'm making a lot of shorts, I don't think it makes sense. I make videos for people that watch long videos. If I make a bunch of shorts that attracts people that watch short videos, YouTube has still not figured out a good interface for watching shorts, especially on desktop. I get sucked into watching videos on my phone or on my iPad, but I really hate watching shorts on desktop. Doc content is made for widescreen, right? Like it's very hard to fit something like this shape into a short. It's a ton of extra work to reformat everything. I was thinking like, what if I just said, turn your phone and like have like a two second countdown, like turn your phone now and then have like a standard 1080p widescreen 16 by nine video after that. But then again, on desktop, that's gonna look bad. You can't rotate your screen. I'm not a fan of shorts. I don't watch them to learn and I'm here to, to teach, not to do memes and stuff. I just don't have the bandwidth to do 
regular videos, streams, shorts. I don't have the energy. That's it for the stream today. I got a little bit of time to eat and play Diablo before I got to go get my kids from school. But uh, that's it for this one. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Check out the Patreon or YouTube membership. There's a free sample library today and a bunch of other older stuff. Appreciate all the support. See you guys later.